So I'm holding in my hand here one of my favorite circuits to design with in electronics, the Humble Op Amp. In fact, I have a little bucket of them here. So op amps, or operational amplifiers, are one of the most ubiquitous and useful circuits in modern electronics. And although if you search for op amps online, you'll find a lot of different types, the basic principles are always the same. The vast variation in the types of op amps you have are going to be for niche applications and squeezing that last few percent of performance out of them. But the basics of understanding and designing circuits with op amps is generally the same. And in this video, we're going to go through the very basic design principles of how you use op amps, how you think about them, and how you understand them. So first of all, we better actually define what it is that we're designing. So what is an op amp? An op amp is a differential amplifier with a very, very high differential gain and an exceedingly high input impedance or input resistance. Okay, so that's the video. We're done. See you next time. But I guess we better actually understand what these terms mean. And it turns out if we understand what these terms mean, we understand how op amps work. So first of all, what is a differential amplifier and what is differential gain? Well, recall a simple amplifier, a not differential amplifier, is just an abstract device that has an input and it puts out an output. Now recall that we're working within a certain level of abstraction here. Uh, we don't have a triangle on our circuit board. An op amp or an amplifier has a vast array of copper and silicon and other internal workings and we're neglecting those internal workings and we're treating it within a simplified model where we have an input and an output. So for our simple amplifier, we just have a single input and the output is some number times that input. So we put in V in and out comes V in times some number. And that number is called the gain, 10 in this example. And a differential amplifier is a very similar concept, except now we have two inputs. We have V plus and V minus, a non-inverting and an inverting input. So how do we get a single output from those? Well, a differential amplifier looks at the difference between those two and multiplies it by some number we call the differential gain. So it's looking at the difference between the inputs, multiplying it by some number, and hence we have a differential amplifier. And an op amp is simply one of these differential amplifiers, except with a very, very high gain, an exceedingly high gain, which is almost uselessly high, a million or so, and more on that in a second. So as we mentioned, an op amp is a differential amplifier, takes the two inputs, subtracts them, multiplies them, and it multiplies them by a very, very large number. The last piece of the puzzle that we need to understand op amps is a high input resistance. So what's up with that? What's an input resistance? So an input resistance or an input impedance is a very common concept to circuit elements. The basic idea is as follows. We have our simple amplifier, for example, and we have an input and an output. Now we plug in a voltage to this and we kind of assume that there's no voltage dropped by virtue of plugging it into our amplifier. But in fact, a small amount of current will have to come in for our amplifier to operate correctly. And as it does, uh, that's going to affect the rest of our circuit. So we can model this trickle of current needed for the amplifier to run properly as a resistor in parallel to ground. So behind the scenes, we have this fictitious resistor to ground inside our device. After that, we have our ideal amplifier, which draws zero current. So what are the implications of this finite input impedance? Well, imagine we plug something into it now. We're going to plug in a device that has its own resistance. And now we have current trickling into our device. And what is the current? Well, it's determined by the amount of output resistance of our thing we plugged in and the input resistance of our amplifier. And the current is just V divided by the sum of those. Notice that this will always lead us to a lower voltage than we expect, a concept known as loading. And really, we see that we've formed a voltage divider between the input impedance of our device and the output impedance of whatever we plugged in. So what if our input impedance is small? Well, if it's comparable to R out here, this is a problem. We've actually dropped half the voltage. But as long as that input impedance is very, very large, we get approximately zero current anyways, and we don't have this loading error effect. So we want typically a very, very, very high input impedance. Now, there are cases where we don't want a very high input impedance, and that's typically with very fast signals, where you can actually have signals bouncing back and forth through a wire. In this case, to minimize that, you match your input impedance to your output impedance, a concept known as impedance matching. But for the majority of cases, especially with these amplifiers, we want a very, very high input impedance, so we don't have to worry about loading anything we plug into it. Now, for an op amp, this input impedance is high indeed. It can be on the order of giga ohm, and that is a very good thing. So each of our inputs, our inverting and our non-inverting input, have very high input impedances. Now a minute ago, we said that the differential gain was uselessly high for our op amp, but the op amp itself was highly useful. So how do we reconcile this? 
And the key to reconciling this is the concept uh, of negative feedback. So to understand this concept of feedback and negative feedback in particular, we're going to make a very contrived circuit. We're going to take our op amp and we're going to wire its output back into its inverting input. This is a classic example of negative feedback. So it seems like a little bit of a strange thing to do, and it might be complicated to think about it first because our output is equal to our input and our output depends on our input. So how do we think about this? Well, let's just work through it. So we turn on our circuit at time t equals zero, and we've placed five volts at our non-inverting input, V plus. Our output is wired to our inverting input, so they're both at zero volts, say. It doesn't really matter, it turns out, as we'll see in a second, but we're just gonna pick a value. Now remember, we have a crazy high differential gain. And here, delta V is equal to five volts. So supposing our differential gain is a million, V out is trying to get to five million volts, and it's immediately gonna ramp up super, super high and start increasing rapidly. Now a moment later, say a nanosecond later, uh, we've gotten all the way to 4.1 volts as we've tried to shoot up to five million volts. So now our delta V, our differential input, is five minus 4.1 or 0 0.9, and it's still really, really large. It's trying to get to 900,000 volts. It's pushing up really, really hard again, but less hard, and we're still swinging upwards. Another split second later, we might be at 4.99 volts. But delta V is still 0 0.01 volts, and our output is trying to get to 10,000 volts. So it's pushing up hard again, but less hard. Maybe a split second later, we've overshot, and we've gotten to, say, 5.05. .05. But now delta V is equal to negative 0 0.05, right? V plus is less than V minus, so V plus minus V minus is negative, and it's now pushing down. And this is the concept of how negative feedback works. Either way, if we're too high, it'll correct itself to push down. If we're too low, it'll correct itself to push up. This is really no different than a pendulum. I should have brought a pendulum, but here's a pendulum. Anything's a pendulum when you have gravity. So if I push this way, it's going to correct back. If I push this way, it's going to crack uh, back the other way. So the stable equilibrium is at the bottom. If I'm too far to the left, it'll push to the right. If it's too far to the right, it'll push to the left. And any time I wiggle it, it's going to naturally correct itself. This is all this circuit, this wiring is actually doing here. So we can even imagine continuously changing the voltage and looking at the output. So look at this. As the voltage changes, the output swings very quickly to follow the output. Unless the voltage changes very quickly, like there, like a step function, the output is going to hug the input very closely. And this concept of negative feedback is really what an op amp is doing. So we've just made a circuit analog of the self-correcting system. Now, what would happen, by the way, if we fed back into the wrong input, into the positive input? Now, if V plus got a bit higher, the deviation would want to push higher still, and that would lead to an even faster output change, and a faster output change, that would be an unstable situation. That would be called positive feedback. The analogy with the pendulum is just balancing it basically like this, where any deviation runs away to one side or the other. So we want to go back into the negative input, and that's called negative feedback, and generally leads to stability. Now another thing that might be bothering you is that we've made a circuit such that V out is equal to V in, but V out is equal to V minus, and Vn is equal to V plus, the difference between those two things is zero, and the output should always be zero. We know just by definition what an op amp does is V out is equal to G times Vn minus V minus. It's a differential amplifier. Let's forget about the details. We'll put an opaque box around it, or a translucent box in this case. And we just have an input and an output. And just by definition of these things, we notice that Vn is equal to V plus, V minus is equal to V out, and Therefore, we can write it in the following way. V out is equal to G times V in minus G times V out. But this actually gives us a way of solving for V out in terms of V in. So we can rearrange the equation, get all the V outs to one side, divide through by one plus G, and what we have is V out is equal to G over one plus G times V in, okay? But recall, however, that we have a uselessly high differential gain. G is 100,000 or a million. And we plug that into this equation here, and we just see that V out is about equal to V in. Another thing to note is that we seem to have made a very useless device. We've gotten a long way to make V out equal V in. And I know an even simpler device that can do that. Uh, a wire will do that. That will hold an equipotential from here to here. So what, what have we done? Have we made the world's most complicated useless device, the most complicated wire? It turns out, no, this circuit is actually incredibly useful. It's very useful to have V out is equal to V in in an op amp circuit like this. Let's see why. So the key is that the op amp is an active device. 
Now a capacitor, resistor, diode, these are all passive devices that don't need power. An active device actually needs power. So you actually need to supply an op amp with voltage in order for it to work. And this allows us to do the following thing. Recall from our high input impedance that if I put a voltage there, no current flows into there. But I can get a lot of current out. If I have 5 volts coming in, I have 5 volts out, and I can put that through a small resistor and get a lot of current. So where is that current coming from? It's coming from the power supplies, not from the input. So our supplies are sourcing or sinking current, and this leads to a different picture of what an op-amp is doing. It's not really passing through the voltage, it's more sensing it and then copying it at the output without drawing any current. This buffers one side of a circuit from another, and it is an incredibly useful thing to do. So this is what an op-amp is and how an op-amp works. Now we can summarize everything that we've just done into two succinct design rules that are so important, they're called the golden rules of op-amps. The two golden rules of op-amp design that basically allow us to design any op-amp is golden rule number one, the op-amp draws no current into V plus and V minus. Why is this? Well, this is because the op-amp has very, very high input impedance. Golden rule number two says in negative feedback, the output adjusts itself so that V plus is equal to V minus. Why? If not, it quickly corrects itself. This is just a property of negative feedback. If V plus deviates from V minus, that really, really high gain pushes back super hard to correct for it such that V plus is about equal to V minus. Now using these two golden rules, we can design basically any op-amp circuit. But there is a few things to note. First of all, these golden rules aren't laws of nature. Golden rule number one, the op-amp draws no current. It's going to draw a trickle of current. But since the input impedance is so high, it's a negligible trickle. Golden rule number two is more subtle. First of all, you have to be in negative feedback. You have to have a, a feedback path from the output to V minus in order for this to work. Second of all, that voltage that you're putting out has to come from somewhere. If you need more voltage than you've actually given it from your power supplies, then the op-amp won't be able to correct for it. And that will lead to a behavior known as railing. In railing, it's as if we have two rails that the output cannot get above or below that are dictated by how much power we give it. If we have enough voltage, and we're in negative feedback, then we can use golden rule number two. But it's important to know when it can fail. So as an example, let's see how we can design a useful circuit using these two golden rules. We have a gain of one circuit so far, our buffer op-amp. V out is equal to one times V in. Let's make a, a gain that's not equal to one. In fact, let's make an amplifier with a, a gain of 11. So how are we gonna do this? Well, with our gain of one op-amp, we have V out is equal to V minus. And our whole idea is that if we can drop a little bit of voltage on our path back from V out to V minus, and V plus is equal to V minus, and V out is higher than V minus, well, V out will have to be higher than V in. So how can we drop such a voltage? Well, maybe we'll put a resistor here. And, you know, we have current going through resistor that drops voltage. Unfortunately, this doesn't work because of golden rule number one. No current goes into V minus. So that's not good. We can't add a single resistor and fix it. Fortunately, we can add a double resistor and fix it. So we'll put one more resistor in that path so that current can flow through the RF and we can get a voltage drop here. So now we've given current a pathway to flow. The current specifically is V out over RF plus R naught and we have dropped some voltage. V out is now higher than V minus because it's dropped voltage. So therefore V minus is equal to V in and V out is higher than V minus. Let's work out the details. So what is V minus? We can see that because we draw no current into V minus, we can actually analyze this as a voltage divider with the second resistor being R0 and the first resistor being RF. The voltage divider equation tells us that V minus, that intermediate point, is R0 over R0 plus RF times V out. But V minus is equal to V in. So we can write it this way. V in times R0 plus RF divided by R0 is equal to V out. And we can rewrite this slightly to get V out versus V in. V out is equal to one R0 over R0 plus RF over R1. That should say R0, I'm sorry. RF over R0. What we can do here, if we want to make this work, we're going to set RF equal to 10K and R0 equal to 1K. And indeed, we've gotten one plus 10 over one, which is one plus 10, which is 11. We've made a gain of 11 op amp. So that's it. That's how we analyze op amps. An op amp is a very, very high gain differential amplifier. You typically employ them in negative feedback 
and this very high input impedance is great because it separates one part of the circuit from the other. We can plug them in without affecting the rest of the circuit. Analyzing op amps is usually just a simple application of the golden rules, as we saw with this gain of 11 op amp. In the next video, we'll go through a few pen and paper examples of how to design more op amp circuits. But until then, thanks for watching.